lots of vendors claim to offer zero trust solutions. But is that framework even applicable to some product categories? You're listening to Defense in Depth. Welcome to Defense in Depth. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me for this wonderful episode, it's Jeff Belknap, who is also the CISO of LinkedIn. Jeff, say hello to the friendly audience. Hello, everybody. And hello, David and mystery guest. He's not a mystery. You've already met him. but he, And he's not a mystery to our audience who's probably saw this on their podcast feed and can see who the guest is. But I will introduce him in, in just a moment. But first... Our sponsor for today's episode is SquareX. Be fearless online. Yes, SquareX actually allows you to open even suspicious or malicious resources fearlessly. How do they do that? Well, we'll talk more about that later in the show. Jeff, our topic today. Zero trust remains a popular buzzword in cybersecurity, with so many vendors identifying as zero trust solutions and can be hard to see how they actually play a part in this architecture. So our guest today, Richard Steenen, who I'm going to introduce in a second, has done the yeoman's work of categorizing these zero trust vendors in order to help make sense of the landscape. Now, Jeff, I'm sure you've heard this before from a vendor that they are a zero trust solution. Do your eyes roll when you hear it? What's your response? No, they don't roll in the back of my head. I pass out. Halfway up. I go into a fugue <laughs> state and I wake up at home and I don't know what happened. We've looked into it. I think it has something to do with hearing that trigger word. Could be Pavlovian, unclear. I think in all seriousness, that is how most CISOs feel at this point when they hear the buzzword zero trust. I, I think... I really appreciate the idea when it started around 2010 and has definitely morphed into it something where our guest is now tracking all of what the zero trust ecosystem and world and what the meaning might be. So I'm really excited to get into this. Yeah, it is an ecosystem and there are ways to achieve a zero trust solution. And that's what our discussion is going to be about. And I'm very, very thrilled. And let me give some huge kudos to our guest today. Our guest has actually been counting the vendor landscape, which I think often when you see like how many vendors are out there, there's a lot of shooting from the hip. Like nobody knows. They, they jump, but literally his job is to find out and count them. Now, it's very difficult to do that because they are coming and going at such a rapid clip. And yet he's doing it. So if you're not on his list, make sure you are. But he is counting as much as you can. Anyways, let me introduce him. He is the chief research analyst over at IT Harvest, none other than Richard Steenen. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. So great to be here, you guys. Thanks. What do most people think it is? And what's the reality? Nathaniel Coffing of Servant said, quote, can you start by defining both what you mean by zero trust and what the security vendors define it as? Perimeter-based solutions don't even register as zero trust if we're using a strict definition. Stephen Martin Rajan of Deloitte said, quote, a technology vendor has to contribute to the principles of zero trust, which is to verify explicitly and implement least privilege in order to have an impact in enterprise environments. At the end of the day, zero trust is a framework and current cyber work streams and products will continue to play a role in the desired end state. Lastly, David S. Jones of Deep Sea said, quote, the product industry still tries to work off of buzzwords and checkboxes. Having a framework with discipline to implement around people, processes, and technology is the only way to sustain a true security posture. I think... Maybe when you get right down to it, could it be conceivable every security solution supports zero trust? Maybe some more than others, Jeff? Oh, God, I blacked out again. Yes. <laughs> I, look, let's just get this out of the way. Zero trust, when we started talking about it, meant something very specific. And it was about this concept that at the time, especially in the early aughts uh, around 2010, when this was quoted by the, the fellow over at uh, Forrester, we were really talking about how do we get away from this model where we 
put up a, just an outer perimeter of firewalls and we say, hey, as long as we have to VPN into something, it's secure. We're, we're all safe. And with time and with maturity, we realize as an industry, that was not the case. We had this crunchy, hard exterior and this nice, delicious, soft inside that all the attackers figured out. And John over at Forrester started thinking about how do we, you know, how do we build this model of, you know, an environment that we can trust without having to just depend on firewalls or a network perimeter? And I think all of that, you know, sort of the Google Beyond Corp and all the things that came out of that, that was really about that. Where we went from there was talking about why do we implicitly trust anything? And then I think, and I would love to hear our guests uh, take on this, I think then that's our, sort of where we lost the plot on the term and it became a buzzword. So I think if you're talking to me about zero trust, I'm going to assume you mean that concept of network perimeterization or deperimeterization. And if you're talking about anything else, I'm going to assume you are in product marketing. And not that you're unintellectual or stupid or anything, but that we are talking in a different context. So Richard, I, I throw this to you. How at IT Harvest have you been defining zero trust? And has that evolved over time? I mean, had, did you have a, like a grand editorial discussion of like, all right, this is the way we're seeing it. If they say, if they do this, this, and this, they fall in this bucket, otherwise they're out of the bucket. Or was that not the case? How did it, was it handled? Yeah, not the case at all. I was treating it as a buzzword. And I think even before 2010, I had heard Zero Trust and I loved it, but it was completely different than what John Kindervar came up with at Forrester. Zero Trust was first introduced to me by people that would solve the problem that when you store stuff at Dropbox, it was encrypted with Dropbox's key. So anybody at Dropbox could read your confidential information, If, but, you, but they didn't because you trusted them not to. Zero trust was encrypt locally, store the encrypted stuff in the cloud, and and you didn't need to trust them. So you had zero trust in Amazon not reading your stuff. You had zero trust in Box and Dropbox. That is a good definition of zero trust. When you get to where we are today, it's not zero anything. It's it's dynamic trust and it's graduated trust based on your posture and where you are and what time of day it is. All these things, which we've ha always had, right? Every network access control system has had those tuning capabilities. Every firewall has had those tuning capabilities since firewall one. So, you know, after I had a database of all, all the vendors at the time, and a process to collect that database, I actually asked my team in India, so 11 people, to go to every single website, about 3,000 of them, and tell me, you know, just check the box in the spreadsheet if they say zero trust on their landing page. And there were 238, and that led to the post on LinkedIn. Because I just wanted to get a feel, you know, how big is this? Now, Today, of course, and, and by the way, since it's not a product category, right, it can't even come close to a product category or a market because it's so diverse, right? It fits into a lot of things like network network access control. Maybe the ZTNA stuff is is fine name for it, but it's like a lot of other things like cloud security, not a market. Each cloud security product already fits into other markets. Who owns this issue? Simon M. of the Cyber Hut said, quote, the majority of IAM vendors, that'd be identity access management vendors, leverage the, quote, identity at the centric narrative. Certainly authorization and policy-based controls are booming too. I would have perhaps expected network providers pivoting more though. Mark Ehlers of Simcor said, quote, the IAM guys think this whole strategy was written for them. Identity and access are major aspects of zero trust, but everyone is missing the layers to support a trusted system service workload slash device to be specific. The industry needs to apply a strategy and methodology to zero trust for workload, identity, access, and transaction. So there's zero trust across all of these. And going back to what you said, it is graduated trust is what it is, or dynamic trust. And by the way, that's a great way of defining it. The cloud won't solve the workload issue. It too needs to incorporate integrity and trust just as if it were on-prem. So going back to your definitions of it's not as zippy, graduated and dynamic trust as zero trust, but it's a better definition, Richard. I like it. 
how should, I guess, the vendors be presenting uh, themselves to us and what should we be looking for? And I know this is kind of a big question, but let's see if you can boil it down. Like, what should they be presenting to make us not have a, a blackout like Jeff just had? Yeah, and, and you know, this really came home to roost for me with a category called digital risk protection, which in a vacuum, you would not be able to tell me what that is, right? Because digital is redundant. There is no analog cybersecurity, right? Except in uh, electronic warfare. And then you, there's no way in the world you'd want to protect risks, right? Those are, should be gone, right? You want to eliminate risk. So, and yet that's the term for threat intelligence vendors. And most of the ones that listened to Gartner who made up this silly term, which pronounced derp, which is not a good thing, <laughs> said that, okay, we're, we're DRP. You go to their website, they say they're DRP. So how does that help you in your SEO? Because nobody in the world is going to buy a box of DRP to deploy, right? They need threat intelligence. They have budget line item for it. And you no longer match your budget line item. So my advice in general to all vendors is just say what you do, say what your product does, name it in a logical way. I hate to say that Fortinet is the best example of this. They just take the tag for what it is, a SIM, an IDS, an IPS, a firewall, and they put 40 in front of it. Perfect. The 40 SIM, you know exactly what you're getting, right? And the 40 NAC, you know exactly what you're getting. Don't obfuscate with the latest buzzwords, be it zero trust or deperimeterized or any of that stuff. Deperimeterized. I like that one too. Jeff, maybe you can think about how a vendor spoke to you about this or really the opening line that didn't, that had the, I guess I'm going to say the opposite of effect of a blackout. What, what was actually, what was that approach? Well, I think it's exactly what Richard uh, points out. I cannot plus one this strongly enough to please Analyst firms have their value, uh, and I think they bring a lot to the industry. This rush to, like, try to name your product to fit a made-up sector or quadrant or wave or whatever it might be, it is really unhelpful for people like me that need to buy these things and have a job to do. What you can do, number one thing you can do to get useful time with me or any other security leader is just tell me what problem you solve. Tell me what you do. And then let's talk about how well that fits in my environment. Like the faster I can get through, like if you come to me and say, I'm a zero trust solution. Now I have to do the homework to figure out what you mean by that and whether that actually solves a problem I have. Because let's be clear, no one has a zero trust problem. No one needs to buy a zero trust solution to their zero trust problem. They have some other problem that they believe zero, a zero trust solution, whatever it might be, may solve. And the less of that translation layer I have to get through, the better. So as soon as I know what you do and, and I can figure out whether that solves a problem for me, it is so much easier to have a conversation and to get further along to the purchasing. Before I go on any further, I do want to tell you about an absolutely awesome sponsor, and that would be SquareX. SquareX empowers organizations to detect, mitigate, and threat hunt web attacks against their enterprise users in real time. Now, as we all know, traditional SASE or SSC secure web gateways can't stop modern web threats that happen on the client side. And endpoint security companies have no visibility into what happens in the browser during a client side web attack, leaving an organization vulnerable. SquareX, with its innovative approach, bridges this gap. Their browser native security product, which deploys within minutes as a browser extension, safeguards enterprise users from a spectrum of web-based threats, encompassing malicious files, websites, scripts, and compromised networks. SquareX offers full visibility into the attack chain, enabling enterprises to effectively threat hunt and identify similar attacks across their networks. You can learn more about protecting your enterprise users against web attacks with SquareX at sqrx.com. That's sqrx.com. That's SquareX, but without the vowels. So don't wait for threats to reach your enterprise. Stop them where they start with SquareX. Remember, it's sqrx.com. Where does this effort fall flat? Amit Chowdhury of Cloudflare said, quote, 
funny how network vendors can claim to do zero trust. It's a zero one scenario. Either you do a VPN firewall or you do zero trust. I guess, I don't know if that's an equation, but whatever. Zero trust architecture is opposite of network security. You don't build a routable network with firewalls. You connect the right entity to another based on identity and context. That's how you trust and verify comes about. Good point. Elliot Volkman of Drata said, quote, if someone says they have a full zero trust solution, they are selling vaporware. I think there's agreement here. It's absolutely about architecture and strategy, but not all tool aligns like VPNs. So I'm going to start with you again, Richard, on this one. I think this last line from Elliot from Drata kind of speaks to everybody. It's about architecture and a strategy and not everybody's on board, but I mean, being that, you know, this during our break, Jeff was asking the question, how many websites do you think say zero trust on them? How many do you think? Probably the, still the same number, though, um, since we did that, we've really built out our processes. So now we track all security products as well. So I can search by keyword. And if I search on zero trust, I get 305 products that say they implement zero trust. So that's almost one in 10 or maybe one in 12 of who you're tracking. Yeah. Yeah. Of who we're tracking. So it's, it's pretty dominant compared to everything else, right? I think we're done saying layer defense or defense in depth, but that's what I go by. That's my framework is defense in depth. Thank you very much. Happens to be the name yeah, of the show. A good name. Yeah. What a coincidence. How did you, you change the name just to get me on? This was wonderful. Well, this was the zero trust podcast, but. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we were considering. I don't think Zero Trust as a name was in vogue at that point when we came up with this name. The White House, the government, and CISA are all in on Zero Trust, right? I so know, they, we've seen. They, yeah, so we started up. seeing their doctrines being published. What they did is they replaced the old buzzword, which was risk management. And, I, I, and I'm, I'm frankly very happy that they stopped talking about risk management. The final version of the NIST framework talks less about risk management than the very first version, which was, you know, mentioned it 250 times or something. And I've just been fighting a career long battle to get people to stop talking about risk management because it's impossible. And why bother talking about it? You know what? People love it. I will just say like for our Super Cyber Friday show, when we do a risk management episode, usually one of our most popular episodes, they love yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. People love it because it's you, it's not technical. It's nothing. You can just kind of throw stuff around. What's risk? And you can measure it. Well, with, I don't know. I'm going to throw this to you, too. Jeff. A lot of people argue we're not doing security. We're doing risk management. What do you think? Uh, I That feels like a nuance. Just like we're, I'm not selling firewalls. I'm selling zero trust network access devices. If a general came to you and said, we're, we're not doing, you know, civil defense. We're doing risk management. You'd fire them. You'd be. You don't want that. You want to fight battles for you. Yeah, we're not, uh, we're nation building, hearts and minds, right, Richard? So I think, <laughs> I think the reality again here is, you know, whether you're talking about the, the network concept, whether you're talking about the framework, I think, I think about the work that I do as risk management. I don't, but I think about that expansively. I think about it as, it's my job to try to help manage risk for the business. But really, again, I've said this before, I think about my job is it's my job to help the business or the organization that I work for succeed. I think in this context where we're talking about zero trust and what it might be, it, it really, the words now outside of the product ecosystem refer to just making sure that we're not going like, okay, this thing comes from IP address 1.1.1.1. We're going to just trust that thing, that it's never going to have a problem, that it will never exceed our expectations for how it accesses data or the network, that we're doing a more layered approach to that, whether that be dynamically granting it access every time it needs it through some sort of like just-in-time access management process, whether it's granting people like Rich or myself access to systems or services when we need it or on a adaptive, dynamic context. It's all about elevating things because where we started 15, 20 years ago was, okay, I put this thing on network one and now it has access to everything in network one, even though it clearly does not need all those things. And I think that's where we've matured to as a security industry to, to be thinking about it as a much deeper nuanced discussion than just implicitly trusting things. Who has a solution? 
Saul Garcia of Mass Data Trust said, quote, can any of us trust any one vendor to provide a complete zero trust solution that uses their own products? I ask because I think some vendors are headed in that direction as we are seeing many of the big players buying lots of vendors. That's my commentary. And Saul goes on to say, and I'm wondering if that warrants a long-term partnership. Now, I will also say that what I've heard from a number of CISOs is they are looking at the platform plays, someone who could conceivably, and again, don't black out when I say this, Jeff, but if the if the vendor has bought enough products and bought enough products that could conceivably build out a zero trust architecture, conceivably they could sell themselves as a quote, get ready for this, zero trust solution. What do you think? What do you think of that argument? I, I certainly believe a lot of strategies in the security or the technology space depend on bundling solutions together and how they play together. Certainly, if you lean into one solution space for one vendor versus all others, you get to know that and you get to know the sharp edges versus the, uh, the useful components of that pretty well. I think the reality, though, is like, let me just be clear. I think that can work. But I think where that can work is is probably a lot more limited than many people would like to admit. If you are a very narrow business, you can absolutely lean in all the way to one vendor's security stack, and it will probably be fine for you. If you are a very diverse, high-scale business, or you're doing something different that nobody else does, you're not just a traditional you know, services shop or B2B shop, you are going to have to do the work of hiring a security team that can understand what products fill in what gaps for what problems that you have. And that's just the reality. It's never as easy as only buy one vendor solution. And I think the good vendors will be very upfront with you that they may have a plethora of products that you can choose that will all work presumably very well together, but there are areas that they are not going to be great in. And nobody wants you to have a giant security hole in the one area they're not great in. They're going to be upfront about that. If a vendor tells you, ever tells you, we do everything and we do everything perfectly, you need to run away far and fast. Question for you, Richard. In your analyst work, do you look at platform plays and the sort of their bundling of products and how they interoperate? Or are you trying to keep your sort of your analysts and your study sort of product specific one by one and not looking at the interconnectedness? How are you looking at them? Yeah, one by one, because I've been lied to by the large vendors for going on 25 years now. Oh, but 26 years ago, they were very truthful. No, no, they were lying <laughs> as soon as I got into being an analyst. Oh, okay. Well, they knew who they were dealing with. <laughs> my, my junior exposure as an analyst was big vendors lying to me. And, and you know, publicly traded ones. What and it, I don't let know me pause, often, Let me pause for a second. What does a vendor lie say? How does it present itself? So, so our audience understands, how does that present itself? Oh, it's just blatant. You say, hey, how many products, Mr. MSSP, how many endpoints do you manage? And they'll blatantly just make up a number on the spot, 1,500, which would have made ISS at the time the biggest MSSP. Um, it, it was just wrong. They had fewer than 500 at the time. And you can catch them in their lies. Or... Microsoft telling me that they're going to have a network firewall. And I said, does it run on Windows? And they go, well, yeah, that's the operating system. I say, it won't work. It's not going to work. Nobody will buy that. You know, blue screen of death in your firewall, not a thing. And Or I'd say, okay, I'll grant you, maybe you can have a stripped down version of Windows. Will it have Internet Explorer on it? Well, yeah. Well, it's not going to work as a firewall. You can't have something that's so vulnerable running in the core of your product, but they had buried Internet Explorer into their operating system. I would have to, I, every six months, they'd brief me on their progress on their firewall and they'd have a new product manager and it literally always a new one. And I would tell them, look at, you know, why should I even listen to you? You're not going to be here in six months because you are going to have a different job because it doesn't work. And that's just one example. It's easy to pick on Microsoft, but every single large vendor all the publicly traded ones engage in this kind of lie where I, 
I just can't believe them if they say, hey, we're going to introduce artificial intelligence, as Palo Alto was talking to Goldman the other day. It's like, that's the big thing is protecting artificial intelligence. And it's like, no, there's no market there. You can't just make stuff up in meetings and expect the industry to follow you. Doesn't happen. Well, that brings us to the tail end of our program here, which at the very end, I like to ask my guest and my co-host, what was your favorite quote and why? And I will start with you, Richard. So please let me know which was your favorite quote and why. I, of course, it has to be Winston Churchill. <laughs> I don't think I, don't I think quoted he, Winston yeah. Churchill, did I? I don't think he replied to this uh, LinkedIn thread, although he is uh, yeah, I, Is he one of your friends on LinkedIn? Richard, because <laughs> by the way, I, I should have been giving you a lot more credit than I was. One of his best friends <laughs> is Winston Churchill. <laughs> but please, Richard, give us your, of the quotes that we got here, which was your favorite? Yeah, so Stephen Rahan from Deloitte, and you've already said this, but the, the last thing he said, at the end of the day, Zero Trust is a framework and current cyber work streams and products will continue to play a role in the desired state of that framework. That's good. And why do you like it so much? Yeah, one, it takes you away from it's not a solution. It's nothing else. It's a framework. So it's a way of thinking about something that and frameworks help you think about something, right? They give you a, a structure to it. And you leave it at that, right? And, and then you build your strategies into the framework, which is fine and certainly much better than a risk management framework. Great. Jeff, what's your favorite quote of mine? I'm going to go with Nathaniel Coffing from Servant, who said, can you start by defining both what you mean by zero trust and what the security vendors defined it as? Perimeter-based solutions don't even register as zero trust if we're using a strict definition. I think this is the thing that always triggers me, so I'm picking out is, you know, what, what do you mean? I believe zero trust exists. I can completely come around to the discussion that zero trust outside of my network-centric view of it exists. I think it just comes back to what we talked about before. You know, you have to just tell me what your solution does. Don't use a term that comes from an industry analyst. That term was built for a different purpose. That term is not built to help, you know, me, a person who is practicing, solve a problem. I really just need to know what it is you're doing and we don't have to put labels on it. We can be, we can do whatever you want, uh, but just help me figure out what you're doing and then let's figure out if it works for me. Excellent. Well, that brings us to the tail end of the show. And a huge thanks to our sponsor, that's SquareX. That's sqrx.com. Be fearless online. Get their web extension. Just go to sqrx.com. That's SquareX without the vowels, sqrx.com. I want a huge thanks to you, Richard, for joining us. This was something I was very much looking forward to, have this discussion, to have you on, because I greatly appreciate the analyst work that you've been doing for the marketplace. Is there something you want to say about IT Harvest, communicated to our audience? What, what would you like to add? Yeah, probably by the time the show airs, we are going to make a massive pivot, right? So we've been covering the space from the perspective of the vendors, right? Their health, their growth, their funding, et cetera. So our users of our platform, which is a subscription SaaS, were investors. Because we are the only ones that had that list of products, we are the only ones who could, I guess, enlist OpenAI to grab all the data from all the vendors' websites and extract their products, the descriptions of the products, their feature sets, and align them with the MITRE ATT&CK techniques that they address. So next week, or the first week in April, we are announcing that this is now a product selection platform. We're going right up against the Gartner Magic Quadrant and arguing that if you're going to make a big decision about a product, you should start with all the options rather than just the ones that have passed through the, the Gartner gauntlet. And that's what we're making available, CISOs now. Very cool. We are very much looking forward to seeing that. That is awesome. Well, thank you again, Richard. Uh, for those of you who want to connect with Richard, we'll have a link to his uh, LinkedIn profile. Maybe through Richard, you could get that introduction of Winston Churchill. I'm not, I'm not guaranteeing anything. <laughs> not guaranteeing. And for Benjamin Franklin, you would have to work through Jeff Bellman. That's right. I, I rep him. All right. 
Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you to our audience. We greatly appreciate your contributions. Please, if you see fascinating discussions online, send those links my way. We love turning those into episodes of this very show. Thanks for contributing. And thanks for listening to Defense in Depth. We've reached the end of Defense in Depth. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss yet another hot topic in cybersecurity. This show thrives on your contributions. Please write a review, leave a comment on LinkedIn or on our site, CISOseries.com, where you'll also see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or a comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to Defense In Depth.